Hey, you guys wanted me to talk about uh, the movie with the incessant feeling of unease. You know, the one where the son's smashing the father's confidence day in and day out. The movie where the son's just beating down on the dad. And you can tell in this photo, he's like the only one not in shade. I think that's enough. The Strange Thing About the Johnsons was a short film made in 2011. I remember this going viral on YouTube about four to five years back. And no one had really talked about how it came to be, who directed it, and at least the people I saw couldn't get over the extremely taboo scenario at the center of it all. I mean, this film was treated like it was on the same level as Meatspin. And when I first watched it, I kind of did the same. I had failed to realize that underneath the grab assing of your guardian, there was a solid short here. It's well acted, I never lost interest, and there are just moments during this movie where I have to pause and think, this looks great. I feel the tension, the dread, and without sounding like a stolen meme, who did this? And the answer is crazy, but not surprising. This was directed and written by Ari Aster, who also directed and wrote Hereditary and Midsummer. What an arc. From a short that became a bit of a meme, the Dicking Down Daddy movie, to one of the best horror movies of the decade, from genetic casserole to hereditary. The irony, staying in theme. So the story is that Ari was attending a graduate film school and every other film he saw there was typical Oscar bait. So he thought, what can I make? Or better yet, what can't I make? What do they not want me to make? Oh, a son drilling his dad. Yeah, that's pretty out there. Let's do that. So I'm aware that some of you may not even know what this movie is. Let's walk through it. And this is really random, but there was a sponsor like two years ago that ghosted me in the middle of our collaboration. I wasn't really upset because we were working through a third party that I wasn't crazy about at the time, but I recorded an ad for it and everything, and it was a great ad. If anything, I was just really upset that I couldn't really set that on YouTube anymore, at least not for an actual reason. Fast forward to now, I get reached out to, and it takes me a while to realize that these are the guys. And honestly, I'm ecstatic, because now I have an excuse to show some of that ad. But regardless of that, I persevered and I went out in a guns of glory. I mean, a blaze of glory. Guns of glory is something else. Today's sponsor. Why do I look so red in this? I look like the fucking guys from Chernobyl. Guns of Glory is a late epic strategy mobile game. The throne is fallen and you have to protect the king, AKA look in the mirror. <laughs> Keep your head up, baby. Experience a steampunk like style and graphics. Did I stutter? Build up your city, get those alliances hot and ready and train the troops to stop cardinal schemes. You know what I'm talking about. You can unveil the secrets of Iron Mask Man and you're gonna wanna hear this, trust me. Uh oh. Did you guys see that? My thing just stopped recording. <laughs> Fucking hell. Hey guys, and welcome back to Not Worth the Meme. Where was I in the sponsored segment? Get down and dirty in the Ramparts minigame. You got a new equipment set, and we got an exciting bunny day event that you, the person who doesn't ever really know how to celebrate Easter, can participate in. You see that guy? That guy right there? That guy plays the shit out of this game. Just straight up ignores his wife and kids to play. I don't endorse it, but can you really blame him? So download Guns of Glory using the link in my description. Use my creator code to redeem an in-game starter pack that'll help you with plenty of resources. And it's only for newbies, limited time only. And if you download the game using my link, of course, I mean, <laughs> You'll be auto entered into our giveaway. So use my code to claim an in game starter pack, and we'll pick some lucky people to win $50 Amazon gift cards. And yes, I'm giving it away. Which I'm pretty sure is enough to buy a portable bidet. Worth it? Download Guns of Glory, and thank you, Guns of Glory, for sponsoring this video. That $250 interface, very factual the amount of money I lost right there. With a 29 minute runtime, there's no wasting time here. So we begin the movie with a crank -a latte And this part is the most off-putting for me by a mile. And I'm sure some people will disagree. I don't think it's debatable. His father walks in. Oh, uh, sorry, champ. I, uh, didn't mean to bust, uh, burst, open the door without your consent. I think this kid at the time of filming was like 17 or 18 but he still looks so obnoxiously young. And it's all very happiness-like with these uncomfortable ass conversations. So he barges in at the wrong time and usually you leave. And then later you tell your wife, you laugh about it, and then you make some cheeky remarks over dinner. But Sydney takes a different approach. And this approach isn't necessarily wrong, but he walks back in and he just addresses the elephant in the room. Relax, bucko, it's just a saying. But he just tells him, hey, what you were doing is normal. Don't feel weird about doing it. We're all human. Do you do it? I mean, I... 
I get way too much pussy to be doing stuff like so that. So you do do it then? Yeah. A lot. And like I said, what he's saying isn't wrong, but coming to sit on his bed and caress him when he probably still has a sweat beat or two is fucking weird. Just bring it up later, when he's still not considering whether or not he's gonna finish after you leave. So he finally leaves, and sure, it was an uncomfortable scene, but everything's pretty tame so far. Ooh, we get to take a peek at the spank bank, though. Who we got, Pamela Anderson? And just like that, you realize that this movie is not afraid of shit. We're going there. We're shown a quick transition montage where you start to see this subtle, devious power dynamic start to blossom with the father and son. Fast forward to a picture perfect family where the father is beaten down mentally and emotionally. Young Isaiah is now getting married even though he continues to assault his father. And he thanks his father for everything as he reaches down and grabs a nice handful of cheek. Sydney shudders and you start to see what's happened. And what does the wife think of all this? Well, she's just another broken cog in this operation. She knows what's happening, what's been happening, but she is so dead set on keeping the peace and keeping up this illusion that everything is okay. I imagine her being in denial. I've done everything right. I'm a good mother, a good wife. I cook, I clean, I throw this amazing reception. Everything is fine. It has to be. Even on his own wedding day, Isaiah cannot control himself. So he finds a secluded area and assaults his father. Starts giving him a blowy, which, I mean, isn't that what the bachelor parties are for? Was he not invited? I I love the little details in this short. In the very next scene, Joan, the mother, is humming while cooking, and she sends Isaiah to tell her father that dinner's ready. Isaiah's wife questions if she can help, and with a slight hesitation, Joan forces out a, everything is under control. That's okay. Everything's under control. You then learn that Sydney's a poet, and not only that, but you see a timeline of his poetry, and the dark turn it has taken. Sydney fears his son. Whenever his son approaches the room, it's played out as if the Reaper himself is a few feet away. It is hot as hell in this fucky ass, hot ass room I'm in. Is that the Grim Reaper? At the dinner table, we see that Isaiah, outside of sex, has a very controlling relationship with his father, and he seems to despise any form of intimacy between his parents. We learn that Sidney is writing a memoir, discussing all of the abuse and the role he has attributed to himself in all this. He claims they are both guilty, and that mindset is later somewhat backed up. And this can be interpreted in two ways. This abuse has either warped his mind to the point of blaming himself for this, an unfortunately common victim mentality, or, and it's never directly talked about, but there seems to be a piece of the puzzle that we as the audience are never given. By Sydney's own admission and Isaiah's later comments, it appears that Sydney might have been the initial abuser here, creating this monster, and then the predator became the prey. But with Isaiah's later comments, it's possible he was also just gaslighting him. Joan is showering and Sydney brings this printed out memoir with a post-it note that just says, I'm sorry, Joan. He has on his cap, so we can imagine he planned to flee right after this. But Sydney just so happens to go to wait in their bedroom to use their bathroom because his is broken. And this is where we truly see this dynamic for what it is. Sydney still very much has the opportunity to leave, but he doesn't. He knows Isaiah will see his memoir, and his fear drives him to stay and almost await the consequences which is exactly what happens. Isaiah calmly reprimands him and threatens him that if another copy of this is seen, it will be more than just a slap on the wrist. And Sydney deletes his memoir. The new year is here and this part is so subtly fucked. Isaiah's giving his new year's kiss, it gets even more intimate and all he does is side eye his dad the entire time. At the end of the party, he breaks a photo out of anger and tells his wife he's gonna stay behind and clean and that he'll be late. His wife seems to have no fucking clue what's happening but almost seems to be walking in the ignorance is bliss footsteps of Isaiah's mother because she doesn't even mention the fact that he Hulk smashed a photo for apparently no fucking reason. I can only assume it was due to this building urge to do something with his dad. I mean, we've seen his aggressiveness in the most inappropriate of situations, so he's unhinged. This is a sickness and an addiction at this point. Sydney's taking a bath listening to a self-help book, only further emphasizing the mental toll of this all. The door's locked and Isaiah's having none of it. <laughs> He busts the door down, Sydney screams in terror, and the screaming continues. Joan can hear it all, but she turns up the volume of the TV and continues to live in her own little perfect world. This shot of them in bed is great. Sydney, obviously traumatized, turns to his wife, who's also not sleeping, wide awake. Just as haunted by the situation, but there's no discussion. Sydney's afraid, and Joan refuses to make it real. The next day, Sydney begins to walk out with the final copy of his memoir that he had hidden, but Isaiah was ready. And what's that? 
Another book of yours? And this is where Isaiah delivers a powerful monologue where he too questions how much responsibility they both have for this relationship. Is he just a monster or does it take two to tango? This is where I mentioned he discusses Sidney leaving out what he's done in that memoir. And it's crazy because Isaiah is dead set on continuing this relationship. He wants it to flourish. He criticizes Sidney for never giving it a fair chance. And it's batshit to listen to, but it's a divisive point in the movie where you don't know what you even want to happen anymore. Who am I rooting for? What did Sydney actually do? Isaiah is clearly fucking broken. And although that doesn't excuse his actions, do we just ignore the nuance in this situation? Sydney rushes out and gets GTA'd, which is the scene where I kind of got taken out a little bit. I feel like just people getting ran over by a car just never works for me. It just always seems so silly. I think of like Scream or Scary Movie or some shit and it just, it's always goofy to me. I don't know if you can really nail it. Whatever, it's fine. It's not a big deal. Isaiah is crushed and won't even let Joan react, yelling at her to call the ambulance. At the funeral, Joan appears frozen and Isaiah regularly interacts with those giving their condolences. Back home, he begins to put on his dad's clothes and Joan approaches him. She questions him as to why his father cried when he drove Isaiah back from prom night. Isaiah claims to have no recollection of what happened and she just says it. Is that when it started? She's dying to know when it all began, but Isaiah continues to gaslight. She snaps and slaps him up, but Isaiah could give less of a fuck of what happens to his mother, clearly. They grapple and Isaiah attempts to burn her face only to be taken down by a fire poker. Dead. And the movie ends with Sidney's final copy of his memoir thrown into the fire, which I think still speaks a lot to the mother's character. Even after all of that, she doesn't want to read it, and she doesn't want anybody else to read it. Even after breaking and murdering her own son, the reality of the situation is put away. And listen, yes, it feels weird to talk so passionately about a movie like this, because I was honestly expecting to just write a bunch of jokes when revisiting this, but I like this movie. And it's not for everybody, no shit. Some of you can't even sit through me talking about it, but I just find it so interesting. So I guess thank you to the, the weirdos that told me to rewatch this. I enjoyed coming back to this bizarre piece of nostalgia. Thank you. If you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like. Here is your second reminder to please leave a like. Please subscribe because I have more content coming your way. Shout out to my beautiful, beautiful patrons for supporting the boy always. And shout out to Adrian LaVey for retweeting my last video tweet. Subscribe to Mr. GG Live. There's a lot of stuff on there that you can watch. Fuck yeah. And as always, I am Mr. GG and I am tired and out.